Welcome everyone. This is the final question and answer session of the February 2023 MBE crash course. I'm wearing my Philadelphia Eagles jersey. If anyone knows who number six is, that's uh, Devante Smith, the receiver, who I'm predicting to score touchdowns today. And for the record, I got the Eagles by nine points. But it's not about predictions. It's about hard work and consistency. And one thing that we've done in this course is consistently do uh, questions together. So let's take uh, a stab at 25 questions as a team. And like I said, please don't submit the answer in the chat until I've finished reading the question for the sake of other students. And also, if you know the answer just because you've seen the question before, please uh, refrain from participating in the question. So um, let's begin. A plaintiff who lives near a factory has sued a company that owns it. Let's look at the call of the question. Should the court allow the plaintiff's expert to testify at trial? So it looks like it's gonna be evidence. A plaintiff who lives near a factory has sued a company that owns it, alleging that a toxin released from the factory caused the plaintiff to suffer a respiratory disease. The company contends that only a small amount of the toxin was released for a brief period, and that in any event, the toxin is not known to cause any respiratory disease. The plaintiff has not disputed the minimal amount and brief length of the exposure. At trial, the plaintiff seeks to call an expert who will testify that in her opinion, the toxin released from the factory caused the plaintiff's respiratory disease. The company has objected to the admission of the expert's testimony. At a pretrial hearing to determine the admissibility of the expert's testimony, the expert testified that she based her opinion on several studies provided by the plaintiff's attorney about another substance that's similar to the toxin at issue. These studies show that prolonged exposure to high doses of the similar substance can cause the respiratory disease that the plaintiff suffers from. On cross-exam, the company's attorney elicits from the expert an admission that she did not consider informing her opinion two recent clinical studies, both of which concluded that there was no connection between the toxin at issue and any respiratory disease. Should the court allow the plaintiff's expert to testify at trial? No, because the expert is relying on studies that she read for purposes of preparing her testimony in this litigation. No, because the plaintiff has failed to show by preponderance of the evidence that the expert based her opinion on sufficient facts and data and that she employed a reliable methodology. Yes, because the company has not met its burden of showing that the expert's opinion is unreliable. Yes, because the sufficiency of an expert's basis for an opinion and the reliability of an expert's methodology are questions of weight for the jury. Good first question. Um, I'll, I'll kind of scroll up. People can take a look back at the question and then I'll scroll back down for the answers. Any thoughts? I believe, Andrew, the, um, the answer is no. Um, yeah. Um, and why what, no and which no? Yeah, it's a, it's a third part of it. Um, when you were reading, um, the study showed that you know, so let me see. Um, can you can you up a little bit? Um, we can see here uh, the expert testified that she based her opinion on several studies provided by the plan attorney. So here, uh, it's going to be related to the study that she did. It's not because of um, you know they already know that that happened because of the um, the issues related to the fact you know. Um, Right, that she didn't. But I'm not. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, Anyone else? That, any yeah, B, B. I guess it's uh, between A and B, and uh, you know, I'm I'm okay with B. Okay. Does anyone have any? Because of this, yeah. Anyone have any other thoughts about why it's B, or on the other hand, why it's D? We seem to be between B and D. I agree. Uh, I think it's Z, just because uh, 
I, I think that's uh, for the jury to find out. Uh, I don't know. Okay, decent. Um, anyone else strongly feel it's B and, and kind of have a reason why? I feel, I think it's B because the facts say that the information she's based, basing her analysis is a similar substance, not the substance. Therefore, I think it's B, it's not. I think you're right. I think similar substance, mm -hmm. right? And that they didn't consider um, recent clinical studies that conclude there was no connection. So there's not really enough evidence to bring it in. Whereas D, um, the sufficiency of the basis for an opinion, the reliability or questions for, wait for the jury, mm, it's actually up to the judge whether we're gonna let the evidence in or not. We are going to the, um, you know, the, there is a question of weight of how they'll consider it based against other evidence, but whether or not we're gonna let it in or not, is not actually a question for the jury. I'll go B here too. Anyone else disagree or agree with B? We've seen that mostly Bs in the chat, a couple Ds. Okay, B, tough question. Um, and yeah, see, Bs have been picked before. Um, B is correct. Under the federal rule of evidence 702, an expert's opinion must be based on sufficient facts and data and the expert must employ a reliable methodology. Here, the expert failed to satisfy those standards. The plaintiff was exposed briefly to small doses of particular toxin in question. However, the expert, however, relied on those studies that showed the effects of prolonged exposure to high doses of a different toxin. Like Grace was saying, there was enough evidence that it wasn't really uh, reliable. D, preliminary questions here, the sufficiency of the basis for opinion, the reliability of the expert's methodology, or for the court or the judge to determine by preponderance of the evidence. So it's not... Uh, it was a preliminary question, which wouldn't be for the jury. And it, we shouldn't let this in because there's too many uh, questions raised by its reliability. So good job. Um, trying to skip around to some shorter ones, but we'll do them as they come. Uh, this is another evidence one. Let's see if we can move to a different subject. All right, I think this is gonna be some procedure. And that's a good way to try to orient yourself by subject. You don't always know, but it seems to be civil procedure based on class actions, federal courts, et cetera. Should the court grant the defendant's motion to dismiss? A runner who took the prescribed medication for shin splints was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. After his diagnosis, the runner sued the manufacturer and several drugstore retailers who sold the medication in federal court in state A. The runner sued on behalf of a class who had also been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer after taking the medication. The runners are citizens of state A and the other members of the class are citizens of A, B, C, and D, and E. The runner is the only named member of the class bringing the suit. The manufacturers are citizens of states B and C. The retailers are citizens of D and E. So it's runner versus manufacturer and retailers. So we have A versus B, C, D, and E. Now the question of conflict is the other citizens are, are uh, from the same state. We'll see if that matters. The runner and the alleged class actions are seeking more than 75,000 for the manufacturer and the retailers. The manufacturer and the retailers move to dismiss all claims for lack of SMJ based on diversity. Should the court grant the motion to dismiss? Yes, because the class members are from the same states as the manufacturer and retailers. Yes, because the class members are from the same state as the runner. No, because only federal courts may hear class action suits. No, because the runner is from a different state from the manufacturer and the retailers. So, Andrew, can you let us know when when we can submit our answer to the chat? That's about to say. Go ahead. You can submit answers. I like that. Now is fine. So could we etch off um or scratch off? So yes, because the class members are from the same state as well. I don't think does it matter whether or not they're from the same class as the runner. I don't think that matters. So B can be scratched off. No, because only federal courts. Um no, I don't think class juristic class actions are just for federal courts. So C, I think, can go. Um, that's because the members are of the same state. No, because the runner is from a different state than that of the. So you need complete diversity first before you can bring a class actions. This is what this is basically getting at. 
Yep. And it's getting at, do they need to be diverse from just the representative or the need to be diverse from every member of the class? I think it's only the representative. All right. I believe you're right. The, the, the chat is heavy, heavy on D. So I think we all. I, I honestly was trying to figure out, remember that, but when I saw everyone was D, it's like, well, must be D, the room, you know? Right. It's good to have the, we're rooting for um, Eagles D tonight for sure. D is correct. The court should not grant the motion to dismiss because diversity jurisdiction does exist. In class action suits, diversity of citizenship is based on whether named parties are diverse from one another, not the named members of the class. Here, the runner is from state A and therefore is diverse from the manufacturer and the retailers. The citizens of the other members of the class is not relevant. So diversity is based on whether the named parties are diverse from each other, the named parties, the named plant, plaintiff and defendants are completely diverse. I think we're satisfied with that. It was a good job by the class. Um, I'll do some of these longer ones later, but I just want to kind of like get the flow, you know, like Rihanna's going to do tonight. I'm trying to timestamp this, this class. Does anyone have a, a guess of what song she's going to start with? Diamonds. SOS. Umbrella. <laughs> I don't know. Um... Yeah, this is a good, good option. She's going to kill it. She's such a good option. All right, look at this contract lesson. Which of the following, if proved, would most strengthen the general contractor's prospect of recovery? Um, well, let's see. A wallpaper hanger sent a contract, a general contractor's telegram. We'll do all paper hanging on new doctor's building per owner specs for 14000 if you accept within a reasonable time after main contract awarded. The wallpaper signed the wallpaper hanger. Three other competing hangers sent the general contractor similar bids in respective amounts of 18, 19, and 20. The general contractor used the wallpaper hanger's $14,000 figure in preparing and submitting his own sealed bids on doctor's building. Before the bids were opened, the wallpaper hanger truthfully advised the general contractor that the former telegraphic sub bid had been based on a $4,000 computational error and therefore was revoked. Shortly thereafter, the general contractor was awarded the doctor's building construction contract and subsequently contracted with another paper hanger for a price of 18,000. The general contractor now sues to recover 4,000. Which of the following would most strengthen the general contractor's prospect of recovery? Right, so what happened here is he got a $14,000 bid and he was using that bid, a general contractor was using that sub, you know, a bid from a subcontractor, that 14,000 to get a contract. And he was awarded the contract. Then the person who submitted the bid told him that was a computational error and so he had to seek um, what we would call mitigation and, and get this $18,000 bid. So now he's trying to get the $4,000 back from having relied on his, you know, uh, his bid, her bid, its bid. After the wallpaper hanger's notice of revocation, the general contractor made a reasonable effort to subcontract with another paper hanger at the lowest possible price. The general contractor had been required by the owner to submit a bid bond and can have not withdrawn or amended her bid on the main contract without forfeiting that bond. The wallpaper hanger was negligent and erroneously calculating the amount of a sub bid. The general contractor dealt with all of her subcontractors in good faith without seeking to renegotiate lower the bid prices they had bid. All right, you guys can submit answers if you like. I th think we can scratch off C because I think that's kind of showing, that's actually showing that it's the subcrunch in the subconscious tractor's favor. Like I made a computational error. So I think C can go. Yes, he doesn't really strengthen anything from the general contractor. All right. Um, general contractor dealt with all subcrunchers in good faith without seeking. I don't know what has to, what negotiating with other subcontractors have to do with this. So I think D can go as well. You said which one can go? I think D can go as well because I'm not sure what the other subcontractors have to do mm -hmm. with his relationship with the current subcontractor that he's dealing with right now. I think A is getting at like expectancy damages, but this is not, I don't think this is an expectancy damage thing because he relied 
on the subcontractor's bid. Um, I don't know how to like, I think it's between A and B though. Um, so let's consider A and B. After the wallpapers hangers notice of revocation, he made a reasonable effort as a contract with another paper hanger at the lowest possible price. That means he did mitigate, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now here, the general contractor had been required by the owner to submit a bid bond and could not have withdrawn or amended her bid on the main contract without forfeiting that bond. Well, well, that B's would show that like I actually relied on it. That's why I had I, like I couldn't change my position on this. And I, I think that's a good answer, I, I guess, between B and A. I think it's better than A. I'm with you. We got some A's in the chat. Boom. I'm, all, I'm still just not clear why A is not like as good, you know? Like I, you know, I don't know. It's just hard. My thing with A is that A is kind of assumed, like he got it for 18,000. That's the lowest possible price that he could have got it for. Uh -huh. like, I don't know if that strengthens the argument so much because he kind of definitely did that. Like I'm saying he definitely did that, but go ahead. With that, we have to remember the, the rule for bids in construction. They are irrevocable um, okay. um, until the person accepts or, or rejects. I tend to agree with Grace that the bid is irrevocable would strengthen the argument. And she's saying that's a, a general rule. But here it said they're required to submit a bid bond and cannot have withdrawn or amended on the main contract without forfeiting that bond. So once they got that $14,000 uh, bid, they submitted their bid and there was no way they could have revoked it. Mm -hmm. Then yeah, it, I think it's B then. Sure. Right. Be correct. If the general contractor had to submit a bid bond relying on bids from some contractors, those bids would generally be held irrevocable. Perfect, Chris. Until the general contractor gets the job and accepts the subcontractor's bids. A is incorrect. The general contractor's mitigation of her damages after the wallpaper hanger revoked his offer will not help the general contractor's case because it does not provide a justification for why the wallpaper hanger's offer was temporarily irrevocable. C. Uh, we didn't really consider C and D. Um, any questions on this one? A is not bad, but B is better. Let's see what they said. The general contractor mitigating damages will not strengthen her chances of recovery. As explained above, the only way they can prevail is to show that the hangar is temporarily irrevocable. While making reasonable efforts to mitigate damages in good faith, it does nothing to prove it's temporarily irrevocable. Right? That, that's what this question was getting at making it irrevocable, as Grace stated. Um, kind of want to jump around the subject board. Uh, we've done some good ones yet. We haven't done any, oh shoot, we could have done that one. All right, let's try this one about a quote 45. Um, still, <laughs> still I'm thinking about the Jordan LeBron thing. I've never seen my class so participative until I said that, I just asked. Right. That's right. That's crazy. As to the switchblade knife and the 45 caliber pistol, the suspect's motion to suppress should be granted, granted, denied, or denied. All right. So it's to, uh, to the blade, to the knife and the pistol. Classic tools. The police had over time accumulated reliable information that a suspect operated a large cocaine distribution network, and he and his accomplices often resorted to violence, and they kept a small arsenal of weapons in his home. One day, the police received reliable information that a large brown suitcase with leather straps, leather straps containing a supply of cocaine had been delivered to the suspect's home and now be moved to a distribution point the next morning. The police obtained a valid search warrant to search for and seize the brown suitcases and the cocaine and went to the suspect's house. So it seems like they have some probable cause here, right? They reliable over time, um, reliable information, a valid search warrant, seems pretty solid. They knocked on the door and called out, police open up, we have a search warrant. That was nice of them. After a few seconds with no response, the police forced the door open and entered. Hearing noises in the basement, the police ran down there and found the suspect with a large brown suitcase and put handcuffs on the suspect. A search of his person revealed a switchblade and 45 caliber pistol. The suspect, potentially Terry stopped, right? Like they had reason that crime was afoot, had him down, found weapons, potential is not so bad. The suspect cursed the police and said, he never would have caught me this stuff if I hadn't been for that lousy snitch Harvey. The police then fanned out through the house, looking in every 
room and closet. They found no one else, but an officer found an Uzi automatic weapon in the box and a closet shelf in the suspect's bedroom. In addition to charges relating to the cocaine in the suitcase, he is charged with unlawful possession of weapons. He moves pre-trial to suppress the use of evidence of weapons seized by the police and statements made. As to the switchblade and the 45 caliber pistol, the motion should be blank. It seems like they could have gone a lot of ways with this question, right? They could have asked about, you know, the statement about the lousy snitch Harvey. They could have asked about um, the Uzi, but they were mostly focused on this, what they found from doing the search. And they did the search because they had a warrant. They came to his house. There was no response. Um, they entered, they ran down and found him there and they put handcuffs on him and searched him. So should the motion to suppress be granted because the search and seizure were the result of illegal police conduct and executing the search warrant, granted because the police did not inform the subject that is under arrest and not read his Miranda rights, denied because the search and seizure was incident to lawful arrest, denied because the police had reasonable grounds to believe that there were weapons in the house. Um, you can go ahead and answer if anyone feels confident. Ooh, the seize came in strong. A lot of C's. Anyone disagree with C? I might have led you to C by the way I was I was thinking about it in my mind because it led me to C too. So if we get it wrong, it's my fault. But that's kind of what I was thinking. Like they had the warrant to arrest him, they arrested him, and you're allowed to do a, you know a little search on him. Hey, where did they found the? Where did they find? Oh, they're just talking about the switchblade knife and the caliber, not the gun that they found. Not the Uzi in the house. That might have been a different story because they already found what they were looking for. Why did they go back into his house? Yeah. That's not this question. So right. reading the answering question about the switchblade and then we're all in C. Yeah. C's get degrees. Perfect. C is correct. Once a person is lawfully placed under arrest, police officers have the right to search this person and the immediate surroundings of the person for any weapons and evidence of the crime without first having to obtain a warrant. Here, the entry onto the home was lawful because the police had a warrant to look for the suitcase. Once the police were lawfully in the house and found the suspect with a the suitcase, they had probable cause to arrest him. This was a valid arrest followed by a lawful search incident to that valid arrest. Therefore, the knife and pistol found in the suspect were admissible. So when I was reading, I mentioned the word Terry stop. That would be more if it was a, a search because they had some reasonable suspicion. This was a legitimate arrest. Like they came and they got the guy with his brown suitcase. Andrew, I think a Terry stop is like mostly for outside, not for like inside the house, right? Yeah, a Terry stop is you don't have a warrant. You're just a cop walking down the street and you see someone who maybe stinks like marijuana. You know, like it's kind of hard to say why. It has to be reasonable suspicion that, you know, some reasonable suspicion out in public and you can do a quick pat down for weapons. That's a Terry stop. What, what that was, what I was reading, I was just kind of thinking aloud, but not as direct as I should have. I should have said search incident to arrest. So I was just clarifying that. But yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, well, I guess we can do this contribution claim one. Why not? Well, I kind of wanted to go in order. What have we done yet? Uh, torts? Do we do a tort? Not yet. No torts? Um, a lot of evidence. Is we didn't have done torts or um, con law. Or property. Or property. Well, why won't they give us some of those questions you did? Um, torch, con law, property. Here we go, constitutional rights. Sounds like con law to me. Okay. Is this con law? Yeah. A statute provides a person commits the crime of rape if he has sexual intercourse with a female, not his wife, without her consent. I feel like we did this one in class and it was interesting. A man is charged with the rape of a woman. At trial, the woman testifies to facts sufficient for a jury to find that the man had sexual intercourse with her, that she did not consent, and that the two were not married. The man testifies in his own defense that he believes she consented to sexual intercourse and that she was his common law wife. At the conclusion of the case, the court instructed the jury that in order to find the man guilty of rape, it must find beyond a reasonable doubt that he had sexual intercourse with the woman without her consent. The court also instructed the jury that it should find the defendant not guilty if it found either that the woman was the man's wife or that the man reasonably believed that the woman had consented to the consexual intercourse, but that the burden of persuasion as to these issues was on the defendant. The jury found the man guilty and the man appealed containing that the court's instruction on the issues of whether the man was his wife and whether he reasonably believed she had consented violated his constitutional rights. The man's constitutional rights were violated as to both issues. Violated by the instruction of whether the man was his wife, but not violated 
by the instruction on to belief as to consent, violated by the instruction on belief as to consent, but not violated by the instruction to whether the woman was his wife and not violated by either part of the instructions. I'll kind of roll up to the question again. Take a moment and then we'll give answers. Is, so this is, it's on the state to prove each of those elements beyond a reasonable doubt. So, is, is, so consent is, is this getting a, a defense? Like, is this an affirmative defense? Yeah, that's what, that's, that's a good point. Is it getting at an affirmative defense or is it getting at the elements of the crime? So take a second. Anyone else? Yeah, you can answer questions now. You can answer in the chat if anyone thinks they know. So I think it's B because um, that that fact. Okay, the about the the belief as to consent. That's for the jury, right? That's the weight of the evidence. Um, I don't think this I is think being it. I don't think this is getting at evidence. I think this is getting at. Oh uh, yeah, it says it is getting at evidence, right? Yeah. What the like if the instruction was. Yeah, I think so. I think it has to do with both. That's why I chose B because I think it it doesn't violate his rights as to the belief of consent. But someone mentioned element of the crime. I thought it was wrong for you know um, as to whether the woman was his wife because the law says something like. Not his wife right here. So that's, I'm thinking about element of a crime. Okay. Does anyone else have any other thoughts about answer? He's not challenging the statute though, right? The statute that says that you only can uh, have sex with uh, your wife. No, he's not challenging the statute. He's challenging these um, instructions, right? I would, say, I would say it's D then. That needed instruction. So the jury... In order to find the man guilty of rape, it must find beyond a reasonable doubt that he had sexual intercourse with the woman without her consent. I mean, that does that sound like a violation? Beyond a reasonable doubt that he had sexual intercourse with the woman without her consent. That seems kind of right to me, right? But if the defendant should find the defendant not guilty, if it found either that the man's either that the woman was the man's wife, right? So if it was man's wife, then um, that's true. Or that he reasonably believed that the woman had consented to the sexual intercourse, but that burden of persuasion as to those issues was on the defendant. That's what I, I think. I think that's the problem, yeah. It's on the prosecution. I think it's on the prosecution, yeah, that you're innocent until proven guilty. So... So the instruction is wrong. So yeah. So that instruction is wrong. Mm -hmm. So that means we can scratch off D. So we believe that the instruction is wrong, right? Yeah, that one of the instructions is wrong, but not both, right? So the first instruction that it must find that he had sexual intercourse without her consent. So it was, that one's not right, but this one. So yeah, what Grace was saying. I think yeah. that this second one as to whether he was his wife. You're saying that it should just all stay on the state. Like they can't just say, oh, not a burden of persuasion on the defendant. Is that what you're getting at for consent? Well, wait, you can have the burden of persuasion on the defendant if it's an affirmative defense. Yes. That's yes. Like, like insanity or like, so I think self-defense is also one. Or consent. I'm not sure if consent is one. That's yeah. I I I just don't think that the burden. I I think B is wrong. That the burden to prove that he's your wife. I don't think. 
It's a tough question. I'm leaning B. Uh, All right. Anyone else have any any uh? All right, solid. Yeesh, twenty four percenters. Me, mm. I was in the wrong back in January. B is correct. In the absence of an affirmative defense, the prosecution has the burden to prove each element of a charge offense beyond a reasonable doubt. Therefore, right, the beyond, if in the absence of an affirmative defense, we were having the exact right conversation. I just want to clarify what was the affirmative defense here. Therefore, during instruction, placing the burden upon the defendant to prove that he was his wife violated his constitutional rights. Good job, Grace. However, the defendant presented an affirmative defense of consent, which we were saying, which shifts the burden of establishing consent to him. As such, his constitutional rights were not violated by the instruction on reasonable belief of consent. Okay, I see why I was confused. I was looking at the at this. This wasn't even talked about. It was this. They were just talking about the second instruction and how there was two there's two pieces of this, two prongs of this instruction. And the first prong of this instruction was um, okay, but the second prong was not okay because that put the burden on on the defendant. And I mean the second the second they. In this instruction, there was two prongs and the burden was on the defendant. And it's not okay to put the burden on the defendant onto whether he was his wife, but it is okay to put the burden um, on the defendant as to the affirmative defense of consent. But whether or not he was his wife was not an affirmative defense. Tough question, good answer. If we can just pull anything from this, it's that affirmative defenses do not require the same constitutional um, restrictions that elements of the crime do, which is that the prosecution must prove um, beyond the reason of a shadow of doubt. Cool. Uh, was that not a con law question though? It was not. Yeah, this one seems more constitutional. That was not my fault because it literally said, were his constitutional rights violated? It seemed very constitutional. Um, all right, well, you asked for it. EPA, Radon, you know the guy from Mortal Kombat who used to work there? is a harmful gas found in the soil of certain regions of the United States. Is that not his name, Radon? Something very close to that. Yeah, I think, yeah. That game and movie was way before your time. If y'all think LeBron is better than Jordan, you definitely didn't play Mortal Kombat. All right, Radon is a harmful gas found in the soil of certain regions of the United States. A state statute requires occupants of residencies with basements susceptible to the intrusion of radon to have the residents tested for the presence of radon and to take specified remedial steps if the test indicates the presence of radon above specified levels. Oh, can I read that again? R is a harmful gas found in the soil of certain regions of the United States. A state statute requires occupants of residences with basements susceptible to intrusion of R to have the residents tested for the presence of R and to take specified remedial steps if the test indicates the presence of R above specified levels. The statute also provides that the testing for R may be done by only testers licensed by a state agency. According to the statute, a firm may be licensed to test for R only if it meets specified rigorous tests relating to the accuracy of its testing. These standards may easily be achieved with current technology, but the technology required to meet them is 50% more expensive than the technology required to measure R accumulations in a slightly less accurate manner. The EPA does not license R testers. However, a federal agency authorizes the EPA to advise on the accuracy of various methods of R testing and to provide to the general public a list of testers that use methods it believes to be reasonably accurate. Okay. A recent established state firm uses a testing method that the EPA has stated is reasonably accurate. The firm is also included on the EPA on a list of testers using methods of testing it believes to be reasonably accurate. The firm applies for a state R testing license, but its application is denied because the firm cannot demonstrate that the method of testing for R it uses is sufficiently accurate to meet the rigorous state statutory standards. The firm sues appropriate state officials in federal court claiming that the state may not constitutionally exclude the firm from performing the required R test in the state. In this suit, the court will probably rule in favor of the firm because the full faith and credit clause of the constitution requires the firm to respect and give effect to the action of the EPA, including the firm on the list of testers that reasonably use accurate methods. The firm, because the supremacy clause of the constitution requires the state to respect and give effect to the action of the EPA and including the firm on its list of testers that reasonably include methods. The state, because the federal statute and the action of the EPA and including the firm on list of testers that reasonably use reasonably accurate methods are not inconsistent with the more rigorous testing requirement and that requirement is reasonably related to legitimate public interest. The state, because our exposure is limited to basement areas, which by their very nature cannot move in interstate commerce. I think there's two answers here we can totally eliminate. Does anyone agree? Yes. Which ones? A and D. 
Yes, I agree with you. A and D. So B and C are obviously picking the opposite people. So you got to look back into it. Um, what are they saying here? Uh, the state to give effect to the action of the EPA and requiring that use of testers or the state because the firm on the list of testers that use the reasonably accurate methods are not inconsistent with the more rigorous state testing requirement and that requirement is reasonably related to legitimate public interest. So what really happened here? Um, a statute, a firm may be licensed to test for R only if it meets these standards. The EPA does not license them but they authorize the EPA to advise on the accuracy of various testing and provide to the general public a list of testers that believes to be reasonably accurate. So they establish state firm that uses the really reasonably accurate, right? It's also including the EPA list. The firm applies for it, but doesn't get it. So I don't know. Um, I'm ready to hear some answers from the, from the crowd. Where is the, the state's uh, regulation in this? I didn't, it says it's something... It's right here. The state statute requires occupants of residence basis susceptible to the intrusion of radon to have the residents tested for the presence of R and take remedial steps if it indicates the presence of R. It's the thing I read like five times. But what it really gets at is that statute, I mm -hmm. believe what C is saying, is more rigorous than uh, the EPA provides for. No, wait, but the last part here says the firm applies a state radon testing license but its application is denied because the firm cannot demonstrate that the methods of testing for r it is it, it uses is sufficiently accurate to meet the rigorous state statutory standards so you're saying that the state statutory standards are more rigorous than the federal or is there just well, if, you, if you read the question carefully the state statute standards are more rigorous and the federal statute there is no federal statute it just it authorizes the EPA to advise on the accuracy of these people and to provide the public thing that believes to be reasonably accurate. Wow. And the firm is reasonably accurate according to the EPA advisory, but the state rigorousness, it doesn't, um, it's not quite up to speed. So I see a lot of C's, I see a B. Then yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't run afoul of any kind of supremacy clause because the federal government's not setting up, they just set a low baseline here and they're letting the states go ahead and do what they want but, to do. But what I think is they, it's an advisory. Okay. It's not a law, it's an advisory. And I don't think this is, it's preempting anything. I'm, I'm leaning C2. All right. So, are you grace positive on B? <laughs> no, we're going to go C, okay. Um, C is correct. The, Federal statute requiring, um, the federal statute is very general, does not regulate our testers to the extent of a license in them. Therefore, the general federal statute does not conflict with the more rigorous state licensing standards, and those licensing standards are not superseded by the federal law and the supremacy clause. Furthermore, the state's licensing requirement is constitutional because it's reasonably related to legitimate public interest. Um, we were between C and B. B is incorrect. It does not conflict with the state statute. It provides less regulation rather than more. Um, so much evidence. We haven't done any torts, 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 torts. What else did we not do? Real property. Property. Mm -hmm. And we finally did a con law question. That was actually the con law. It wasn't just a constitutional evidence question. Um, I think they're trying to tell me something with all the evidence in. Oh, here seems torty. Yeah, this seems tortious. All right, Ooh, very tortious. So the plaintiff's best argument opposition to defendant's motion would be that the defendants are jointly and severally liable for the plaintiff's entire harm because of why. The plaintiff was a passenger in a car that was struck in the rear by a car driven by a student. The collision resulted from the student's negligence and failing to keep a proper lookout. The plaintiff's physician found that the collision had aggravated a mild osteoarthritic condition the arthritic condition in her lower back and had brought on a similar but new symptoms in her neck and upper back. Six months after the accident, so sorry, I can not read this word, give me a pause. The plaintiff was a passenger in a car struck in the rear by a car by a student. The collision resulted from student's negligence, failing to keep a proper lookout. The plaintiff's physician found that the collision had aggravated a mild osteoarthritic condition in her lower back and had brought on a similar but new symptoms in her neck and upper back, her neck and her back. Six months after the first accident, the plaintiff was a passenger in a car that was struck in the rear by a car driven by a doctor. Okay, that's foreseeable. The collision resulted from the doctor's negligence and failing to keep a proper lookout. 
The plaintiff's physician found that the second collision had caused a general worsening of the plaintiff's condition, marked by a significant restriction of movement and muscle spasms in her back and neck. Back, back and neck. I said back and neck. Her back and neck. The physician believes the plaintiff's worsening condition is permanent, and he can find no basis for apportioning responsibility for present worsening condition between the two automobile conditions. No basis for apportioning responsibility. He believes it's permanent. The plaintiff brought an action for damages against the student and doctor. At the close of the evidence, as outlined above, each of the defendants moved for directed verdict in his favor on the ground that the plaintiff had failed to produce evidence on which the jury could determine how much damage each defendant had caused. I think it should be called judgment as a matter of law, but I'm not going to get too picky. The jurisdiction adheres to the common law rules regarding joint and several liability. The plaintiff's best argument in opposition to the defendant's motion would be that the defendants are jointly and several liable for the plaintiff's entire harm because the wrongdoers rather than victims should bear the burden of impossibility of apportionment. Doesn't sound bad to me. The defendants breached a common duty that each of them owed to the plaintiff. I don't love that. Each of the defendants was approximate cause in fact of all the plaintiff's damages. I think that's categorically false. The defendants are joint tort feasors who aggravate the plaintiff's pre-existing condition. I don't think they are joint tort feasors. Um, anyone have any answers to this one? A? Hey. I kind of like drop back down to the answers, please. Sure. So can we maybe just scratch off B because just because you have a common duty to them, it's about whether or not you have are the proximate cause of the injuries. So I don't think B is correct. Each of the defendants was the proximate cause. In fact, of all plaintiff's damages. Why was someone slandering John Stockton earlier, too? I caught that. It's crazy. I wasn't slandering him. I'm just saying. I played against John Stockton. <laughs> and Shaquille O'Neal, like Magic Johnson. The defendants are John Torres, who aggravated. Can you move your thing, your cursor to the right? All right, yeah. So the defendants are joint who aggravated plaintiffs' cases. John Stark never did you. I'm leaning A, like the class, because it's a true statement. Right, this guy has got to be uh, compensated for his injuries, and we're just gonna say, "Oh, you can't figure out who is apportioned to." Well, see, uh, you're not gonna be compensated. No, he's gonna be compensated, and in the lack of being able to apportion, I think they are gonna have to bear the burden. Also, by process of elimination, um, they're not joint towards users. They didn't do it together. They weren't the proximate proximate cause of all the plaintiff's things. Like they were not each all. They were. Split 80 20, 50 50. That's a categorically wrong statement. And like you said, B it would be my second best answer, but I don't think that is enough just because you breached a common duty. Well, you breached it at different times, you know, um, in different events. I like A, just based on what I was saying and what the class seems to agree with. A is in, are you going to where the requirement of actual proof under the facts would result in a harsh result on an innocent victim, courts have traditionally held the defendants to be jointly and severally liable for cause of fact, considering the injury to be indivisible as a matter of policy. Um, B is incorrect. Their issue is not a duty, which is proven by rather cause and fact. I feel good about that one. We did everything but real property, right? Yeah. Um, it seems like crops. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, this one's tough. If you've done it before, please don't answer. A woman died devising land that she owned to another state to her daughter who was then 17 years old. A neighbor who owned the property immediately adjacent to the land wrongfully began to possess the land at that time. For 25 of the next 20, sorry, for 24 of the next 25 years, the neighbor planted and harvested crops in the land, hunted on it and parked cars on it. However, in the six year after he took possession of the land, the neighbor neither planted crops nor hunted nor parked cars on, on the land because he spent that entire year living in Europe. The neighbor built a small gardening shed on the land, but never built a residence on it. When the daughter was 28, she was declared mentally incompetent and had a conservator appoint, appointed to oversee her affairs. 
Since then, she has continuously resided in the care facility. Um, an applicable statute provides, an ejectment action shall be brought within 21 years after the cause of action accrues, but the person entitled to bring the action is under 18 or mentally competent at the time the cause of action accrues and may be brought by such person within 10 years after attaining 18 or after the person becomes competent. If the daughter's conservator wins an ejectment action against a neighbor, what will be the most likely explanation? The daughter was 17 when the neighbor took possession of the land. Um, because the daughter is mentally incompetent, the statute of limitations has been told. The neighbors built a residence on the land. The neighbor was not in continuous possession of the land for 21 years. I know someone messaged me, they got it wrong. I think you and I got it wrong together in class. We got a lot of D's coming in. Can you, scroll, can you scroll up a little bit, Angela? Of course. I'm a school master. A lot of people are saying D, and I think they are correct. And it's, it's good. I think I got this answer wrong before because I was considering the statute about her being, um, you know, underage or her being mentally incompetent. But if you see, when the cause of action accrues, it's in between then, right? Um, it's, she turns 18, and then she turns 28 when she's mentally incompetent. So the reason why he wouldn't get it is because he wasn't in continuous possession. He was going to Europe for a year. That's the best argument. I'm so it's not about, it's not about, you're saying it's not about her competency. It's just about when he, like when, like, like whether or not he had the right continuous time of possession. Mm -hmm. Because if they're under age 18, 10 years later, which she'd be 27 then. So it was after, 28 was after 10 years after she was 17. So that wouldn't even apply. It's tough to see that, but practice makes perfect. Um, the time period to acquire type of average possession is 21 years. The neighbor's not been continuous possession because they went to Europe for a year. Even if the daughter was a minor, the tolling statute would not assist her because the minor ended, her minor ended within one year when she turned 18, and the extension period of 10 years would allow her only 11 years in which to bring her action. The daughter's mental disability has no effect on the running of the statute because she was not mentally incompetent at the time the neighbor began adversely possessing the land. Thus, there would be no tolling of the statute. So yeah, super tough question, but class is doing good. Um, so we did all, everything, every subject. Cool, right? Grace, what'd you say? Um, that I don't remember if we did everything. <laughs> If we did what subject, don't you think we did? I don't remember if we did all the subjects. I know, but which one do you think we didn't do? Because I think we did. Uh, let's do another common law one. Kill the umpires, this sounds fun. I might be yelling, no, I'm just kidding. Win or lose, I'm happy we made the Super Bowl. A baseball fan, just like the Phillies said this year until we lost the World Series. A baseball fan has a fierce temper and extremely loud voice. Sounds like my dad. Attending a baseball game in which a number of calls went against the home team, the fan repeatedly stood up, brandished his fist, and angrily shouted, kill the umpires. The fourth time he engaged in this conduct, many other spectators following the fan, rising from their seats, brandishing fists, and shouting, kill the umpires. It's just getting people excited. The home team lost the game. Although no violence ensued, spectators crowded menacingly around the umpires after the game. As a result, the umpires were able to leave the field and stadium only with the help of massive police escort. For his conduct, the fan was charged with inciting the riot and was convicted in a jury trial in the state court. He appealed. The state Supreme Court reversed his conviction. In his opinion, the court discussed in detailed decision of the United States Supreme Court dealing with the First Amendment free speech clause and incorporating the 14th Amendment. At the end of that discussion, however, the court stated that it would not resolve how, on the basis of these cases, the United States Supreme Court would decide the fan's case. Instead, it stated the court has always given the free speech guarantee of the state's constitution the broadest possible interpretation. As a result, we hold in this case where no riot or other violence actually occurred, the state constitution does not permit this conviction for incitement to riot to stand. The United States Supreme Court grants a writ of certiorari review the decision of the state Supreme Court. 
In this case, the United States Supreme Court should affirm the state Supreme Court decision because the fans' ballpark shout is com common place hyperbole, hyper, hyperbole, sorry. Affirm the state Supreme Court decision because the fans' ballpark shout is commonplace hyperbole that cannot consistently with the First and Fourteenth Amendments be punished. Remand the case to the state Supreme Court with its direction that it resolve the First and Fourteenth Amendment free speech issue that is discussed in such detail. Dismiss the writ, the writ as improvidently granted because the state's court supreme, the state Supreme Court's decision race, rests on independent, adequate state law ground. Reverse the decision of the state Supreme Court because incitement to violent action is not speech protected by First and Fourteenth Amendments. Very tough question. Kill the umpires. Is it common ballpark hyperbole? Is it independent adequate state grounds? That's what we see most people coming, coming in with. Why um, is it D uh, is not protected and he was insane of violence? Well, let's see, what did the state say? What did the, the state say? The court is always going to free speech guarantee the state's constitution, the broadest purple in interpretation, right? This court stated that it need not resolve how because it would not decide its case it would give the state's constitution a broad interpretation. But I think you said in another lesson that states are allowed to give additional protections to, to people, right? They're allowed to go a little bit further. Um, yeah, like uh, Florida, for instance, with, with the privacy. Florida has additional privacy protections. You just can't infringe upon it. So, so yeah. if this is giving the broadest interpretation and that means it's, Construing in light favor to the person, then because they're trying to protect more speech, then infringe on more speech, and then that would be, I guess, that would be C then, right? If it's if it's resting on that ground of their state's constitution. I'm leaning C. Everyone else leaning C. A couple of D's. But I'm not confident because of that incitement speech. It's not really protected speech, also, right, under the First Amendment. I think PD and another person the might have. does not permit the conviction to stand. What do you think? Anyone else think C, D, A, B? I, I don't think uh, to incite a riot, I don't think you need to actually have a riot uh, for it uh, to, be, to be like convicted. Uh, I think you just, uh, incitement to riot is uh, unconstitutional. The issue is whether the state is basing their decision on the US Supreme Court law or their own law. They're, they're, although they discussed the US Supreme Court issues, they still specifically decided it on their own state constitution. I so, agree. With so it turns on, sorry, yeah. Oh. I agree with the leader. Okay, yeah. So then this turns on whether they relied then on mm -hmm. the, the that federal constitution in their decision, but here they did not. They just did their own. They didn't need to. They said the state has its own laws that are on point. We don't even need to rely on it. Okay. Good job, Alida. The state court's decision rests on independent, adequate state law ground because it explicitly held that would not resolve how the Supreme Court would adjudicate the matter based on federal law, but rather it would give the state constitutional provision the broadest possible interpretation and does not permit this conviction for incitement to right to stand. The court therefore should dismiss the writ as improvidently granted. Tough, tough questions. But that's a very common answer on the test. I even said it in my PowerPoint. Independent, adequate state law grounds. Oh, see, this is, I thought about this earlier today, algae rhythm, right? Do you know where algae rhythm comes from? Most of you didn't know when I said that, right? Because no one watched Space Jam 2, because it wasn't that good, because LeBron is not as good as Jordan, case point. Everyone. I knew you were going to try and do that, man. You always, you always come for LeBron. you like Ernest Cantor. Ernest Cantor is always coming for LeBron. If I said, here's your chance to do your dance at the Space Jam, everyone knows what I'm talking about. If I said algae rhythm, people are like, oh, Space Jam too. Like, that movie was not that good. Just saying. Why I, do you I, know that? 
What's that? Why do you know that? I watch Space Jam 2. I was pumped for it. I like LeBron. I like basketball. That's a better question. Space Jam 2 is solid. I saw Toy Story 3. I've seen um. You hate watch Space Jam 2? That's dedication. You didn't see Space Jam 2? I did not. No. Yeah, see, so how do you guys love LeBron so much, but you don't even support his feature film? Like, where you guys are a different generation than me. I'm just kidding. Okay, so in this case, the court should hold the panel selection process as blank. Ooh, we're back to the Constitution. A particular state, I'm not living and dying with Jordan anyway. Like, I was more of an Iverson fan, for the record. A particular state has a state employee grievance system that requires any state employee who wishes to file a grievance against the state to submit that grievance for final resolution to a panel of three arbitrators chosen by a party from a statewide board of 13 arbitrators. In any given case, the grievance in the state alternate in exercising the right of each party to eliminate five members of the board, leaving a panel of three members to decide their case. At the present time, the full board is composed of seven male arbitrators and six female arbitrators. A female state employee filed a sexual harassment grievance against her male supervisor in the state. The state's attorney exercised all of her five strikes to eliminate five of her female arbitrators. At the time she did so, the state's attorney stated that she struck the five female arbitrators solely because she believed that women as a group would necessarily be biased in favor of other women, another woman who was claiming sexual harassment. Counsel for the state employee eliminated the four males and one female arbitrator, all solely on the grounds of specific bias or conflicts of interest. As a result, the panel was all male. So they targeted her for being a woman. That doesn't seem good. When the panel ruled against a state employee on the merits of the case, she filed an action in appropriate state court challenging the panel selection process as gender-based denial of equal protection. In this case, um, yeah, the answer, that's what we're looking for, the answer. In this case, the court should hold that the panel selection process is unconstitutional because the gender classifications used by the state's attorney in this case does not satisfy the requirements of intermediate scrutiny. Unconstitutional because gender classification used by the state's attorney in this case denies the grievance to the right to a jury made up after her peers. No, I know very right. nice going through. Constitutional because the gender classification used by the state's attorney in this case satisfies the requirement of the strict scrutiny test. Constitutional because the gender classification used by the state's attorney in this case satisfies the requirements of the rational basis test. Ooh, this test is this is harder than it seems because we know that gender discrimination is intermediate scrutiny, but this is more talking about, I'm not more talking about, but this is also talking about a uh, jury trial. All of her five strikes to eliminate the female arbitrators. And she stated that she struck them solely because she believed women as a group would be more biased from another, from men, basically. So we have a B, unconstitutional, we have an A, because the a couple A's, a couple A's, triple A's, because the gender classification used by the state's attorney in this case does not satisfy the requirements of internet scrutiny. Unconstitutional because the gender classification used by the state's attorney in this case denies the grievance the right to a jury made up of her peers. Unconstitutional because the gender classification used by the state's attorney in this case satisfies the requirements of strict scrutiny. Constitutional because the gender um, satisfies rational basis. So can someone explain to me, is this gonna be rational basis, strict scrutiny or intermediate scrutiny? And why? It's intermediate because gender goes under intermediate scrutiny. Okay, and it's targeting based on gender. I like that, everyone agree with that? Yeah, I think that's all you need for this question. It doesn't matter. Am I thinking too much into it that, it, that it's... Um, I think so. Okay. I don't know. I was thinking if that applies, it's not a law, you know? It's jury. So that's why I chose B. Wait, you may have a jury of peers. Um, I could be wrong, but aren't you not entitled to a jury of your peers? It's the fair cross section of the jury. Yeah, you don't have a right to that. Right. I'm with you. So, eh? Job, everyone. I was not 100% on that. I had to think about it. Well, I had to trust in y'all. That's why we're a team. Grace, I'm not. You're, I'm not mad at you because I was thinking the same thing. Like, is it? Should it be a different level of scrutiny because it's a jury trial? But no, it's just I was thinking about it too much. 
So everyone, let's read the explanation. The state attorney in this case intentionally excluded arbitrators based on gender. The Supreme Court has held that peremptory challenge based solely on gender unconstitutional violation of equal protection because they reinforce negative stereotypes against women without furthering the governmental interest of fair trial. Similarly, the state's attorney in this question is making a gender-based classification, so the state would need to show that the classifications are substantially related to an important government objective. Because the state attorney's argument that women would simply be biased towards a female claimant, they failed to demonstrate that exclusion of female arbitrators would be substantially related to the need for fair arbitration. The constitutional right of a jury to one's peers only applies to a formal jury trial, not arbitrations. Oh, that was very important too. This was arbitration, not jury trial. We kind of overlooked that. Um, let's get off the constitution. Ooh, real property, Black Acre. Okay. If the court rules that the elderly woman's mortgage is entitled priority over the woman's mortgage, which of the following determinations are necessary to support that ruling? So the elderly woman's mortgage has priority over the woman's mortgage. The owner of Black Acre and Fee Simple mortgaged Black Acre to a man to secure a loan of 100,000. The mortgage was promptly and properly recorded. The owner later mortgaged Black Acre to a woman to secure a loan of 50,000. The mortgage was promptly and properly recorded. So the owner, he's mortgaged it to a man for, for a loan of 100. Then he mortgaged it to a woman for 50, properly recorded. Subsequently, the owner conveyed Black Acre to a businessman. This guy's doing the most. After a year late, about a year later, the businessman borrowed $100,000 from an elderly widow and gave her a mortgage on Black Acre to secure repaying the loan. The elderly woman did not know about the mortgage held by the woman. The understanding between the businessman and the elderly woman was that the businessman would use the $100,000 to pay off the mortgage held by the man, and the elderly woman would therefore have a first mortgage on Black Acre that he would use it to pay off the mortgage. The elderly widow's mortgage was promptly and properly recorded. She had no notice of the previous mortgage. The businessman paid the 100,000 received from the elderly woman to the man and obtained a record of lease the man's mortgage. The $50,000 debt secured by the woman's mortgage was not paid when it was due and the woman brought appropriate action to foreclose during the owner of the businessman and the elderly widow as defendants and alleging that the woman's mortgage was senior to the elderly widow's mortgage on Black Acre. If the court rules that the elderly widow's mortgage is entitled priority over the woman's mortgage, which of the following determinations are necessary to support that ruling? So we have elderly woman versus woman. Elderly widow versus woman. Woman um, got a mortgage for a loan of $50,000, proudly recorded. Elderly widow later gets a, um, a mortgage for $100,000, and she has no knowledge of the mortgage held by the woman. And she also has an agreement that the $100,000 would pay off the mortgage and she would have the first mortgage on Black Acre. And she recorded it. The man's mortgage was originally senior to the woman's mortgage. So who's the man's mortgage? This person, right? And there's gonna be used to pay off. That's interesting. The man's mortgage was originally senior to the woman's mortgage. The elderly woman is entitled to have the man's mortgage revived for her benefit. And the elderly widow is entitled to be subrogated to the man's original position as senior mortgagee. There's an argument there. I don't hate that. The man's mortgage, which originally seen the woman's mortgage, and there are no countervailing equities in favor of the woman. Doesn't really consider the widow. There are no countervailing equities in favor of the woman. The elderly widow is entitled to have the man's mortgage revived for her benefit, and the elderly widow is entitled to be subrogated to the man's original position of senior mortgagee. That has a lot of merit. The man's mortgage was originally senior to the women's mortgage. There are no countervailing equities in favor of the woman, and the elderly woman is entitled to have the man's mortgage revived for her benefit, and be subrogated to the man's original position as a senior mortgagee. Okay, there's a lot to all of these. I feel like D has the most to it, right? D just seems the most complete. You guys can pick answers. Um, this one says it was senior, that she's entitled to have to benefit, and that's entitled to be subrogated. What does this one additionally add? So this one is senior. Oh, that there's no countervailing equities. That's the only difference between A and D. No countervailing equities. And what's the difference between D and C? The mortgage was senior to the woman's mortgage. She doesn't, she doesn't assume that. I think you need to assume everything. I think B and C can be eliminated. Yeah. And so it just comes down to countervailing equities in favor of the woman. Do we need no countervailing equities in favor of the woman? What are they getting at by trying to say whether or not there's countervailing equities? 
that's the question of the night, right? Um, that there's no countervailing equities, that there's nothing inequitable to the woman. There's no reason why the woman's being super screwed. I mean, that's kind of the lamest terms I can give you, but I would assume D just based on like doing test questions and usually no countervailing equity seems like something that'd be nice to have. I know people don't like going with my gut, but I would go D. Yeah, it's one of those countervailing equities. Um, that could be a rap name, rap album. The original order in the man's mortgage, the woman's mortgage, conveys to the businessman of filing the widow's mortgage. Therefore, in order for the court to find that widow's mortgage as priority over the woman's mortgage, it must treat the agreement between the businessman and the widow as a subrogation of rights for which the widow purchased the man's mortgage. If the man's mortgage was originally senior to the woman's mortgage, and the elderly widow is entitled to have the man's mortgage revived for her benefit and be subrogated to the man's original position as senior mortgagee, then the man's mortgage now held by the elderly widow is senior to the woman's, and the elderly widow is entitled to hold the man's position as first mortgagee. Therefore, both the terms are required. Finally, it's impossible that the woman can have an equitable argument against the transfers of the agreement was not technical between the first mortgagee and widow, making this determination necessary as well. It's kind of just like I said, like she could have an argument and we would need to like make it necessary as well. So this is just about the subrogation of rights. Like if she's going to win, she has to have the subrogation of rights. Well, if you looked at it, I mean, she, she was not first and right first in time. So I just dropped my phone, but she was not first and right first in time. But in order for her to win, she would have to step into the shoes of the senior mortgagee, have her rights subrogated. There'd be no countervailing equities, and that would entitle her to winning. Um, let's try the civil procedure one. A man, a citizen of state A, oh, I can't wait for 2023, a non-binary gendered individual, citizen of state A, student A, robot from state B, but the robot had enough feelings to be considered human. So a man, a citizen of state A, filed suit in state B federal court as a representative of class action against the state B corporation. The man filed a motion to certify the class act class consisting of approximately 250 people from across the United States. The man claimed that the corporation defrauded the consumers under state B law by failing to refund taxes it collected after state B reduced its sales tax. The man is seeking 77,000 compensatory, da compensatory damages, but no member of the other classes would owe more than 100. That seems problematic, right? He's, he's seeking 77,000. They only are owed 100. The corporation asked the court not to certify the class. Is the court likely to certify the class? No, because the amount of controversy is not exceed 5 million. No, because the man's claims are not typical of the claims of the rest of the class. Yes, because the class action is superior to other avenues for fairly efficiently adjudicating this controversy. Yes, because the man's claims exceed 75,000. The man's diverse from the corporation. Any thoughts? From the crew, you can pick. You can guess your answers. I mean, not guess your answers. Choose your answers. Alan Iverson, your answers. Man, how else can I infuriate Generation Z? Harry Styles sucks. <laughs> I don't know any. I, watermelon Sugar High song of this song of our generation so do they all so this is getting at basically like they all have to have the same like typicality commonality numerosity that all has to point towards the relief as well and it's not typical you're 77 grand that's a lot of money that's a lot of cheese that's yeah bucks. right the bucks is nothing to sneeze at but it's not not typical right he is in basketball the man's claims is worth 77,000 damages because he's attempting to represent the rest of the class with no other claims more than 100 because the man's claim must be typical. And you said it can't. Commonality, adequacy, um, numerosity, and typicality. Excellent. Um, in response to the need for additional toxic waste landfills in the state. So how are we going to dismiss this suit? Seems to be a constitutional one. In response to the need for additional toxic waste landfills in the state, the state's Legislator enacted a law authorizing a state agency to establish five new state owned and state operated toxic waste landfills. The law provided that the agency would decide the locations and size of the landfills after an investigation of all potential sites and a determination that the particular sites chosen would not endanger public health and would be consistent with the public welfare. The community in the state was scheduled for inspection by the agency as a potential toxic waste landfill site. 
because the community's residents attained most of their drinking water from the aquifer that ran under the in entire community, a citizen group made up of residents of that community sued the appropriate officials of the agency in federal court. The group saw a declaratory judgment that selecting their community as a site of a toxic waste landfill would be unconstitutional and injunction preventing the agency from doing so. The agency officials moved to dismiss. Which of the following is the most appropriate basis for the court to dismiss the suit? The case presents a non-justiciable political question. The interest of the state in obtaining suitable sites for toxic waste landfills is sufficiently compelling to justify the selection of the community as a location for such a facility. The 11th Amendment bars suits of this kind in federal courts. The case is not right for decision on the merits. Oh yeah, you can answer your question. Scroll up a little bit, please. Any special guests tonight from Rihanna? Who does she collaborate with? Drake. Oh yeah, what's my name? Definitely not Chris Brown, right? That wasn't even a joke, that was just bad. It was like a true statement. Who else does Rihanna collaborate with? Eminem. I was gonna say Eminem. Oh, that'd be so cool. The Eminem just came out. For my generation, at least. Not for the young bucks, but who's that guy? Did he perform the last yeah, no, Super last, Bowl, didn't he? Yeah, Dr. Dre, 50 Cent. For people in my, for the 33 year olds of the world, 33 year old guys, that was like dream Super Bowl performance. What's yeah. the last one, Andrew? What's up? Can you scroll down? Nah, they're oh. not millennials. Millennials are, millennials are defined by allegiance to Jordan. <laughs> That's the line right there. If you're allegiant to LeBron, you're a Jet Z. If you're allegiant to Jordan, you're a millennial. It's as simple as that. All right, what's the answer? We got a lot of Ds. <laughs> right on the merits. Why would it, can someone explain to me why it's not right yet? Yeah, because it was scheduled for inspection. That line is like all you need. Mm -hmm. That it's they would decide, the agency would decide the locations based after an investigation of potential sites. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's, it's, it's not ripe yet. Uh, my umbrella. Hello. The case arguably is not right for adjudication because the agency's inspection does not itself pose any risk of harm to residents and community. The residents face a risk of harm only if the agency selects their community as a site for landfill, but these facts is unclear whether or when the community will be selected. All right, let's do some evidence. Now, the dream Super Bowl halftime show for Gen Z would be like um, the Island Boys. <laughs> a homeowner sued a plumber for damages resulting from the plumber's allegedly faulty installation of water pipes in her basement, which caused flooding. At trial, the homeowner is prepared to testify that when she first detected the flooding, she turned off the water and called the plumber as an emergency number for help, and that the plumber responded, I'll come by tomorrow and redo the installation for free. Ooh, that's an interesting statement right there. Is the homeowner's testimony regarding the plumber's response admissible? No, because it's offering compromise. Yes, no, because it's hearsay, not an exception. Yes, as a subsequent remedial measure, or yes, as evidence of the plumber's fault. Yeah, PD, you're my era. That's what my era. So this is a tough one. I'll come by tomorrow and redo the installation for free. Is this subsequent remedial measure? And why are people saying C? Yeah. Yes, I believe C. Um, <clears throat> it's, um, you know, here it is it's just. Uh, but isn't, um, isn't that the opposite? Isn't it subsequent remedial measures are not admissible? 
wouldn't it be inadmissible because it's a subsequent remedial measure? You're right. Yeah, I believe yeah. yes. It's because of this, yeah. Wow, who did that? <laughs> Me. Oh, I was just like, oh my God, there's a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> you're right though Andrew, i think they're like admissible to show something was fixed for other reasons other than negligence yeah right 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 no you can bring yeah to show like control and right. like to show control or other things along those lines i think yeah but what do we want him to show that he controlled the the, the toilet like we know that we have some D's. I think it's admission. I'll come by and redo it. I'm admitting that I did a bad job. Redo it, yeah. I mean D. So it's not like they're bringing it in as subsequent remedial measures. They're just saying it's like other evidence. About right. The plumber statement was not a subsequent remedial measure because no measures were taken. Rather, he was simply staying here to come by and fix the problem, right? They, were, they weren't bringing in, like, evidence. That subsequent remedial measure is, like, now the toilet's been fixed. He must have broken it. Like, it was just his statement. But A is interesting, too. It was not an offer to compromise because there's no pending dispute. It was just him literally saying, I'll come by and fix it. It's a tough question. Very tough question. Um, uh... We've done that one too many times. A defendant is on trial for theft. At trial, the prosecutor called a husband and a wife. They testified that as they looked out their apartment window, they saw thieves across the street break the window of a jewelry store, take jewelry, and leave a car. Um, sorry, I was distracted by whatever Alito was sending us, but it seems interesting. A defendant is on trial for theft. At trial, the prosecutor called a husband and wife. They testified that as they looked out their apartment window, they saw thieves across the street break the window of a jewelry store, take jewelry, and leave in a car. The wife telephoned the police and relayed to them the license number of the thieves' car as the husband looked out the window with binoculars and read it to her. Neither of them has any present memory of the number, okay, present election recorded. The prosecutor offers as evidence a properly authenticated police tape recording of the wife's telephone call with her voice given the license number, which is independently showed to belong to the defendant's car. It's coming in. Is it coming in? Yeah. I think so, but maybe not, right? Offers evidence of properly authentic police tape recording of the wife's telephone call with the, her voice given the license plate number. She definitely had firsthand knowledge. Oh yeah, you guys can answer. Um, A's and D's, so sorry, I eliminated one of the answers. But I think she had firsthand knowledge. She relayed in the number, she had knowledge. Is it hearsay with any exception? Because he said, she said, she said, because he, he related to his husband and it's relayed through the, the uh, police recording. I mean, that's the argument for why it could be hearsay. But still, through all that, I think it will prevail because it is a present sense impression. She was just literally saying what she was seeing. I also think you could bring it in potentially as no present memory of the number. If they would have given us a different question, it could potentially be a recorded recollection. But I think it's definitely a present sense impression. Yeah. The recording satisfies a present sense impression exception to the hearsay rule because the wife was relaying the information in real time as reported by the husband while he was observing the event live. Um, can you just give me a minute? What is this mumbo jumbo about millennials 81 to 96? Okay, yeah. Doesn't sound like, it seems like a lot of y'all were born after 96, or just around then, I don't know, whatever. A cyclist suit at 96, that's when Iverson came into the league. I remember that. That's when, see, I remember 96. A cyclist sued a defendant corporation for injuries to student sustained when she was hit by a truck owned by a defendant and driven by his employee who was making deliveries for the defendant. The day after the accident, the employee visited the cyclist in the hospital and said, I'm sorry for what I did. At trial, the employees testified they exercised due care. Why is a cyclist admission, I was going to say admissible, it seems admissible. Why is a cyclist testimony relating what the defendant's employee said at the hospital admissible to prove negligence? Prior inconsistent statement, statement against interest, statement by a party opponent agent, statement of then existing state of mind. Um, you got you all, you can answer. 
CCC. It's not a statement against interest because he's available, right? If he was unavailable, it could be a statement against interest. So it's probably a party point admission. I don't see any inconsistencies. It doesn't seem to be D. We like C. C you get degrees. Awesome. Um, Let's try this one. This could be this could be our downfall as a team, issue preclusion and claim preclusion. I think in February 2023, this has been the trickiest issue that we as a team have encountered. Is the court likely to preclude, and Mark's not here, my so-called master of preclusion. Is the court likely to preclude the car manufacturer from litigating the merits of the teacher's negligence claim? An accountant properly filed a adversity lawsuit against a car manufacturer in state A federal court. The accountant sought compensation under negligence claim for damages he suffered when the ignition of his car malfunctioned. After the accountant obtained many documents and emails through discovery, indicating the manufacturer's long-standing awareness of ignition problems, the manufacturer stopped participating in the litigation. Shortly thereafter, the court issued a default judgment against the manufacturer. After the default judgment was entered, a teacher filed suit against the same manufacturer in federal court in state B. The teacher sought damages on the same negligent theory put forward in the accountant's lawsuit against the manufacturer. Is the court likely to preclude the car manufacturer from mitigating the merits of the teacher's negligence claim? Yes, because the entry of a default judgment against the manufacturing counts case. Yes, because the application of non-mutual offensive issue preclusion would be unconstitutional. No, unless state aid law permits non-mutual offensive issue preclusion. No, despite the entry of a default judgment against the manufacturing accounts case. Go ahead, Nance. We can hear some answers and thoughts. Oof. A's and C's, C, C, A, or C, A, A, a split. Who would have thought that the class would be split on issue and claim preclusion? Um, and no thoughts about D? Is the default judgment gonna amount to a, a ruling on the merits? I think a default judgment is considered like a final judgment, but it doesn't appear that like the actual issue was litigated. Right. It wasn't actually litigated. And I think that that's what's needed for issue preclusion. Um, not for no, for um, yeah, issue preclusion, collateral estoppel. Right. And this is issue preclusion, not claim preclusion, right? Yeah. Right, that was actually litigated, isn't that it? That is an important part. We have a lot of people picking A and a lot of people picking C. Anyone have any reason? I mean, I'm not saying it is D, I'm just considering D. Um, why would we pick C or A? Or D? Or B? I think I picked C thinking it was claim preclusion, but it says issue preclusion. Yeah, and it says the issue of negligence. Okay, so we don't really like C anymore? I don't like these questions. No, no one likes uh, The teacher, the teacher is not part of this claim, but it's the same issue. Mm -hmm. It's the same issue, different party, right? But I don't so know. So this is issue preclusion because claim preclusion is the same parties. Yeah, it's definitely issue preclusion. But is it uh, actually litigated? I think is a, is the question that I'm 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 wondering. Well, I think it's D then because it wasn't litigated. It just was a default because one party stopped um, engaging. I don't right. think it has to do with state A law. I'm not. I'm changing to D. Anyone else with uh, Grace? Yes. D's and people who picked uh, A, what do we think? Yeah, why A though? Why would A be okay? Um, anyone who picked A have an argument for A? I like to I hear. I think that A is go is 
is answering a question for claim preclusion. Is a default judgment like the end of that case? Does that conclude it? Is that the final judgment? Yes, it's on the merits, a default, unless the court says it or otherwise without so why prejudice. Wouldn't it, why wouldn't it be A then? If it's on the merits and that concludes it, isn't that what they're looking because for? Because it's it's another party and it wasn't litigated, the issue per se. This is just a procedural thing that when par one party stops engaging, the court can, so, you know. Uh, no one, <laughs> I'll be honest, no one's spoken up for C or A. I mean, it, I think we're between A and B and it comes down to this. Is this um, dismissal default, where does it say? They stopped participating, they issued a default. Is that going to preclude them from litigating the issue? My gut is no, because of what Brighton said, it wasn't actually litigated right? We don't know if they were negligent or not. We just know they stopped participating. So, I mean, this could be our, could be our red racket. Sticking with A? All right, fair enough. We've been like doing it. so good. Well, this could be it. Uh, not, not us. All right. D is correct. Issue preclusion is not applied because the issue of the car manufacturer's negligence was not litigated and determined in the first case. The entry of default judgment does not amount to actual litigation, right? It needs to have been actually litigated. We learned one thing today, whether we got it right or wrong, we were 50-50, but we learned as a class that issue preclusion, why was it issue and not claim preclusion? Because it was narrow. It wasn't the same parties. It was the issue. And why is it not going to be available? Because it wasn't actually litigated. It was just a default judgment. We have no idea whether the manufacturer was negligent or not. So we're not going to be able to impose that on a subsequent case. Um, it's true. Tough question. Very tough question. Uh, oh. <laughs> Sorry, I just didn't want to, after that question, let's do something more. Let's do some murder or something. Um, yeah, this sounds fun. A defendant trial for gang-related murder, just what I wanted. The prosecution introduced as former testimony a statement by a gang member who testified against the defendant at a preliminary hearing as now invoked his privilege against self-incrimination. Is it if, if the defendant now seeks to impeach the credibility of the gang member, which of the following is the court most likely to admit? Evidence that a gang member has three misdemeanor convictions for assault. That seems like prior bad acts. We're trying to impeach the credibility of the gang member. What is he doing? He's testifying against him. I don't think we're looking for bias here. Testimony by a psychologist that persons with the gang member's background have a tendency to fabricate. Hmm, not bad. Testimony by a witness that at the time the gang member testified, a gang member was challenging the defendant's role in the gang. That sounds very biased. Testimony by a witness that the gang member is a cocaine dealer. Just because you're a cocaine dealer doesn't mean you're unreliable. I think, um, I mean, I, I kind of, I kind of led people on. We like B, bias. Anyone disagree? Perfect, bias, right? That's always a strong answer. Um, summary judgment. Yeah, let's try it. The warden of a state prison prohibits the photograph, photographing, the photographing of the face of any prisoner without the prisoner's consent. A news photographer wanted to photograph a notorious mobster incarcerated at the state prison. To circumvent the prohibition, the photographer flew over the prison yard and photographed the mobster. A prisoner who was in prison for a technical violation of regulatory statute happened to be staying next to the mobster when the photograph was taken. When the picture appeared in the press, the prisoner suffered severe emotional distress because he believed the business association friends would think he was consorting with gangsters. The prisoner suffered no physical harm as a result of the emotional distress. The prisoner brought an action against the photographer intentional and reckless infliction of emotional distress. What is the best argument the photographer can make in support of a motion for summary judgment? No reasonable person could conclude the photographer intended to photograph the prisoner. The prisoner did not suffer any physical injury arising from the emotional distress. A news, as a news photographer, the photographer is privileged to take photographs that others cannot. No reasonable person could conclude that photographer's conduct was extreme and outrageous as the prisoner. 
The prisoner brought an action against the photographer. Yeah, you can pick your answers. Um, I think you just spoke about this in the review, like that short review. Like, was this extreme and outrageous? Yeah, because it's IIED, that's what they're bringing, right? Is he bringing IIED? Yes. Well, yeah. What did you say that? Uh, last sentence of that paragraph. Here. Yeah, IIED. We got to show that was extreme and outrageous. This is a tough question, honestly, because I never said that after every question, but this one's tough because you thought they were getting at privacy or invasion of privacy or NIED of the bystander, but then you're like, oh, they're just getting at this guy. So just this guy's ID claim would best be, um, you know, outrageous, like I said in that short review. See, Brian, coming to the morning session, valuable. Um, hopefully you don't have to come in July, but we'll be doing I'm not coming back, bro. Sorry. I think I'm doing UBE in July. UBE, MB, the OOB. I don't know, though. Florida's my baby. I just can't leave it alone. All right. The defendant charged robbing the bank. The prosecutor supplied the court with information from accurate sources establishing that the bank is a federally insured institution and that this fact is not subject to reasonable dispute. The prosecutor asked the court to take judicial notice of the fact. The defendant objects. Okay, it's criminal, robbing a bank. The court must take judicial notice, instruct the jury that is required to accept the judicially notice fact as conclusive. So that's must, must. The court must take judicial notice and instruct the jury that it may, but is not required to accept the judicially notice fact as conclusive. I like that. The court may refuse to take judicial notice because judicial notice may not be taken of essential facts in a criminal case. Let's, let's hold on to that. The court must refuse to take judicial notice because whether a bank is federally insured would not be generally known within the court's jurisdiction. I don't like A or D, to be honest, because this is civil. Civil is must, must. Criminal is must, may. Yeah, great, great, good job. Y'all can answer between B and D. I think must, may. It's not an essential fact, really. It's just whether they're federally insured or not. Must, may. Must, may. Make sure everyone knows that. Civil, must, must. Criminal, must, may. This no flake shampoo is my least favorite question. I'm doubt to where they ask like six times. I don't like it in any form. It's long and I don't even agree with it totally. Okay. Um, what must we do? What do you guys want to do? Real property? Con law? Any? Let's do real property. Real right. property. Yeah. Let's do that property. If the buyer wins, why would it be that the buyer wins? We would wonder. A woman owned Black Acre, her home. Her daughter lived with her and always referred to Black Acre as my property. Two years ago, the daughter, for valuable consideration, executed and delivered to her boyfriend an instrument in the proper form of a warranty deed, purporting to convey Black Acre to the boyfriend in fee simple, reserving to herself an estate for two years in Black Acre. The boyfriend promptly and properly recorded the deed. One year ago, the daughter died and by will, duly admitted to probate, left her entire estate to her mother. So, okay. One month ago, the daughter, for valuable consideration, executed and delivered to a buyer an instrument in the proper form of a warranty deed, purporting to convey Black Acre to the buyer, who promptly and properly recorded the deed. The daughter was then in possession of Black Acre, and the buyer had no actual knowledge of the deed to the boyfriend. Immediately thereafter, the daughter gave possession to the buyer. The recording act of the jurisdiction provides no conveyance or mortgage of real property shall be good unless subsequent purchase for value and without notice unless the same be recorded law. What is that? What jurisdiction is that? Notice. Nice. Because it doesn't say first to record. Last week, the daughter filed and fled the jurisdiction piece. Upon learning the facts, the buyer bought an appropriate action against the boyfriend to quiet title to Blackacre. If the buyer wins, so why would the buyer win? So the woman by will left her entire estate to the daughter. The daughter, for valuable consideration, executed and delivered a buyer warranty deed to convey Blackacre to the buyer. She was then in possession, had no actual knowledge of the deed to the boyfriend. How did the boyfriend have it? Two years earlier, for valuable consideration, actually delivered her boyfriend instrument of a warranty deed, um, reserving her an estate in two years for Blackacre. The boyfriend recorded it, but he didn't have possession of it. But then when the woman died, she left it to the daughter, and you would think that stop by deed would reactivate this. We're actually going to find for the buyer, so let's see why. Um, right? The, date, the daughter had nothing to convey to the boyfriend two years ago. I don't believe that's true, actually, because it's stopped by deed. The daughter's deed to the buyer was not to take effect until the, after the daughter's deed to the buyer. The buyer was first in possession. The daughter's deed to the boyfriend was not in the buyer's chain of title. 
This is a tough question. I'll, I'll open the floor up. Okay, we have some Ds coming in. Maybe it's not as tough as I thought I would think you guys would think it is. Why do we think it's D? Either of the two ladies who... Because when the daughter gave it to the, to the boyfriend, it wasn't actually hers to give yet. So wouldn't that be A? I think when the buyer received it from the daughter, um, there was nothing like in the chain of title to like convey that it was given to the the boyfriend. So he didn't know about it. And what would he that make him? Is this a wild deed situation? Yeah, wild deed is like it wasn't in the chain of title. Mm -hmm. And what would that make him? Uh, BFP. Exactly. That's what it's getting to for me. D is the only thing that makes him a BFP. Right, he had no notice of anything, so he was a BFP. But I'm, I'm sorry, A, B, and C, I don't think are correct because of the stopple by D. Yes, yeah, she didn't have anything to convey, but she was going to because it was left to her. So, under normal circumstances, it actually would have been conveyed to the um, boyfriend, right? Because she did have that power. But if it's not in the title, then I think we're gonna have a wild deed. Yeah, she's a subsequent BFP, exactly. Um, solid, tough question. Uh, that one didn't seem so bad. How about this one? Oh, I like this one. A patient received anesthesia while giving birth. Upon awakening from anesthesia, she discovered a severe burn on the inner portion of her right knee. The patient has brought a medical malpractice action in which she has joined all the physicians and nurses who exercise control of her position. Her person, I also talked about this this morning, my short review, Brighton. The delivery room, the medical procedures, and the equipment used during the period in which she was unconscious. The defendants have jointly moved for summary judgment. The patient has produced affidavits that establish the applicable professional standard of care was violated. What would be the patient's best argument against this motion? At least one of the defendants had control over whatever agency or instrumentality caused the patient's injury. The defendants were acting in concert. This is how they used to introduce Alan Iverson. They'd be like, Alan Iverson. And they'd be like, Carl Malone, John Stark, you know, it's the same way. A, at least one of the defendants had control. B, they were acting in concert. C, the patient had produced affidavits that established that the applicable professional standard of care was violated. D, the patient was in no way responsible for injury. What do you guys think it is? What do we mean an A? Yeah, what if I read all the answers like that? And now, let's start a work on. They used to always make me crack up. It's like Kobe Bryant. Alan Ivers. Um, all right, let's see. I think this might be the last of our 25 questions. I have a pretty good internal clock for when 25 hits, but the algae rhythm always working like LeBron getting a cramp in the fourth quarter. Like LeBron having to join up with the best players. Like Hall of Famer Scottie Pippen. Yeah. So what do we think now? It's going to be the Mavericks and the Suns as the best in the West? I think the Suns are going to be pretty tough with Kate. Denver, Denver. Yeah. Yeah, Mavericks have uh, Kyrie and um, Luca, but the Suns have the ultimate ring chaser, the legend of Generation Z, <laughs> Kevin Durant. All right. A defendant is charged with aggravated assault. The physical evidence at trial has shown that the victim was hit with a lead pipe in the back of the head and on the forearms and left in an alley. The medical examiner has testified that the injuries to the victim's forearms appear to have been defensive wounds. The victim has testified that he cannot remember who attacked him with the lead pipe. He would further testify that he remembers only that a passerby found him in the alley and they had told the passerby that the defendant had hit him with the lead pipe and that he lost consciousness. The defendant objects to his proposed testimony, arguing that it's here saying that the victim had no personal knowledge of the identity of the perpetrator. Is the victim's testimony concerning his previous statements to the passerby admissible? No, because the prosecutor has failed to show that it's more likely than not that the victim had personal knowledge of perpetrator identity. No, because the victim has no memory of the attack itself and therefore cannot be effectively cross-examined. Yes, because the victim is subject to cross-examine and there's sufficient showing of personal knowledge. Yes, because of the victim's own out-of-court statement. We can answer. I'm a little bit, yes, yeah, CCC. That was what I was leaning. I'm happy to see C's coming in. I like C. Right? Why is there sufficient personal knowledge? Can someone explain? 
I think any personal knowledge is like enough. And right. he's just saying what he's saying that he can't remember what attacked him. He only remembers they found him in an alley and they told the passerby the defendant hit him with the lead pipe and then he lost consciousness. And now they're going to ask him about it. I tend to think C. Anyone disagree? Good job. Um, C is correct. The victim may testify to his prior identification made to the passerby because even though he currently lacks memory, he's subject to cross exam, which is sufficient to satisfy the hearsay exemption. Further, personal knowledge is supported by the finding of defensive wounds on his forearm, which indicates that we have seen who attacked him. I mean, that's a weird way of looking at it. I guess I, I was wrong. I thought that was the last question. Um, nothing like a adjoining parcel question. A father owned two adjoining parcels known as lot one and lot two. Both parcels fronted on Main Street and abutted a public alley in the rear. Lot one was improved with a commercial building that covered all of the Main Street front on lot one. There was a parking, large parking lot in the rear of lot two with access to the alley only. 15 years ago, the father leased lot one to his son for 15 years. The son has continuously occupied lot one since that time. 13 years ago, without the father's permission, the son began to use a driveway in lot two as a better access between Main Street and the parking lot in the alley. So it doesn't seem like it's necessity because there's another access. Eight years ago, he conveyed lot two to his daughter, and five years ago, the father conveyed lot one to his son by a deed that recited, together with all appurtenances. Until last week, the son continuously used the driveway over lot two to the son's parking lot in the rear of lot one. Last week, the daughter commenced construction of a building on lot two and blocked the driveway used by the son. The son has commenced an action against the daughter to restrain her from blocking the driveway to the parking lot at the rear of lot one. The period of time they require prescriptive rights is 10 years. If the son loses, it'll be why. Um, the father owned London one and two until eight years ago. The son had access to the parking lot from the alley. Mere use of an easement is not adverse possession. No easement was mentioned in the form in the deed from the father to his daughter. Yeah, you can answer. No, you're good, Alita. You're good. Can you scroll up, please? Yeah. That was my gut to Alita, to be honest. TBH. When he conveyed it to his daughter, didn't that like kill off the easement? And, and merge, right? There's a merger argument here. So then it ends. Right. He owned two of them. He leased it. Eight years ago, he conveyed it to his daughter. Five years ago, he conveyed it to his son. So he owned them both until eight years ago, right? And it's 10 years. So you can't have an easement over like, if you own both parcels, how could you have an easement when the same person owns them? It would have to have been, there hasn't been enough time basically. This is them. Wait, are you also trying to get at that? It has to be one set of land and then he grants an easement? Is that what you're getting at? Like, let's, let's look at this scenario. So he, 13 years ago, he was using the easement, right? That would be cool. That would be long enough to get the easement. But the problem was when he started using the easement, the father owned both of those lots. It wasn't until eight years ago that he conveyed the lot to his daughter. So eight years ago, you were actually using an easement over someone else's property. Two, the, the, the previous five years before that, you were crossing over your own property. The five, you know, there was no easement. It was just, you own both lots. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. I think A is our best argument here. Yeah. Brief explanation. The driveway between lots one and two is an easement appurtenant. The father owned all lots one and two until he sold lots two to his daughter eight years ago. Therefore, there's only been easement appurtenant existence for eight years. Um, let's see. I don't mean to get you guys excited that we were about to finish because usually I do short questions. We've been doing some longer ones here. All right. A plaintiff sued a defendant for psychiatric malpractice and called another doctor as an expert witness. During the witness's expert testimony, the witness identified a text as a reliable authority in the field. He seeks to read to the jury passage from the book on which he's relied in forming his opinion on the proper standard of care. The passage is admissible as a basis for his opinion, as substance evidence of the proper standard of care, admissible as a basis for his opinion, but not as substance ever the proper standard of care. Admissible because a witness's custom credibility cannot be supported unless attacked. Inadmissible because the passage should be received as an exhibit and not read to the jury by a witness. 
by the witness. Yeah, you can answer. I'm leaning towards the same one. Why are you picking A? I think I've gotten this one wrong before and I think A, I like A now. Why do we like A? Why wouldn't it be able to come in as both? That's well, why I like A. <laughs> yeah. It's reliable think, in the field. Yeah, substance evidence is the proper standard of care. I think the first time I looked at it, I was like, oh, that seems a little bit much, right? But to your point, why not? It seems like it's reliable. If we, if the, if the, um, you know, the judge let it in, then why not, right? Good job. Good to have smart class. Under the learned treatise exception to hearsay rule, the passage from the text is substantially admissible because it's established as a reliable authority on direct examination of the expert and therefore is admissible not only on the basis of her opinion, but also substantially to establish the proper standard of care. Good job. Um, all right, awesome. That's the 25 questions. We did amazing. I mean, obviously you've seen, I've gotten a bunch of them wrong in the past. So, you know, getting 25 out of 25 is not like a, a possible thing. It's something that is done with a smart class, with me having done a lot of those questions before. And, you know, it's just good. Good for us to see um, confidently marching through the questions. Let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break.